Welcome to another message from Columbus First Assembly. Thanks for listening as we strive to learn and live the Word and ways of God. Our hope is that you're encouraged by today's message. We're concluding a four-week series on the topic of worship. I started it. Pastor Matt Eckerd had the second week. Our worship leader, Nathaniel Diener, had last week, and I'm going to conclude it this week. So to get us all on the same page, uh, I'm just going to review all of the points, the major points that we all made. Number one, worship is actually, it literally means worth-ship. It is expressing worth. It is praising something. It is standing in awe of something and expressing that awe to it. It doesn't necessarily have to be God. And there's nothing wrong with that. You, uh, you praise someone for their new car. You like their car. You praise it. Man, it's a good color. Or you just like the, the special wheels that it has or uh, something else about it. And so it's praising something. Number two, we are created to worship. It is in us. It is something we will all do because we are created to worship something. And number three, it's not complicated. Worship is not complicated. It's just doing those things I said, expressing worth, praising something, standing in awe of something and expressing that awe. Pastor Medecker two weeks ago uh, showed us the value of worship and that we regularly come into God's presence. And while we're in God's presence, it begins to work in and minister to our lives. And then we come out of the presence of God. We come out of worship so that we can go and work for God, serve God, do battle for God. That is what we do. And he made this statement. Worship is love responding to love. Worship is love responding to love. It is God's love for us and our response back to him. And then last week, Nathaniel helped us to sh- help show us the value of worship music in our lives and how God works through worship music. And he told us three things that were very beneficial with music. Music helps us learn and memorize scripture. It helps us learn the ways of God. I'm going to, um, I'm going to sing just a bit of a chorus that some of you may know, and I'd like you to finish it with me. Oh, how he loves. Let me, let me get a different key. Oh, how he you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. What's the next part? He gave his life. What more could he give? And then it goes on. Oh, how he loves you. That's great theology. It's not necessarily the scripture, but you have learned the truth. Do you know that there are times when I was feeling beat down by the world? I I had fallen into maybe some thoughts that weren't right. I had said something to someone and hurt their feelings or was critical about someone and not feeling loved. And a song like this comes to mind. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life. What more could he give? And it reminds me of the truth that I am loved by God. Music can help you do that. Secondly, music can help you walk through difficult times. And and, uh, Nathaniel talked about the situation with he and Mallory when, when they had had a miscarriage and how both of them had songs that came into their hearts and their lives. Helped them through that rough area. Music is incredible for doing that. And then thirdly, he said, opens our hearts for God to do something in us. When you are worshiping through music, music. It sets your heart up in a place where God can begin to do some things in you. That's the power of music in our lives. But today I want to talk to you outside of music. I want to talk to you about how you can worship God outside of singing and music. And so this morning we are going to go to Matthew's gospel. And if you would take Whatever version of the Bible you have, translation, electronic, uh, manual, these verses will not be on the screen. Others will later. And turn to the fourth chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Early in Jesus' life, he's born. He is just beginning his ministry. He's been baptized by John in the Jordan River. He comes out of the Jordan River. The Spirit appears. It descends upon him. And then immediately it says, immediately, verse Number one, chapter four, Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. And for 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and became very hungry. And during that time, 
The devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, No, the Scriptures say, People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to, a whole, the, to the holy city Jerusalem, to the highest point in the temple, and said, If you're the Son of God, jump off. For the Scriptures say, He will order His angels to protect you, and they will hold you up with their hands, so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. And Jesus responded, the scripture also say, you must not test the Lord your God. And next the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain. And he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. This had to be a supernatural encounter for, for Jesus to be able to see all of these things. And he said, I will give it all to you if you will kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him, for the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil went away and the angels came and took care of him. We're going to come back to this passage in just a little bit, but let's begin to set the tone for what I want to talk about. Besides music, how can I express my worship to God? Number one this morning. You can express your worship outside of music by this. You express worship through work. You express worship through work. See, I love to work. I always have. Even before I was in full-time ministries, I, ministry, I loved going to work. I don't know something about me. And, and I loved going to work to the extent that it, it sort of bothered me. That I loved going to work. It felt kind of unspiritual that I liked working so much. Um, I even thought maybe it wasn't right. I was a young Christian, and the, the Word of God, I knew the Word of God said that we were to love God. He was the main one we were supposed to love. And I thought, but I'm loving work. Is, is it okay? And then the Lord dropped something into my heart. This really helped me. The Lord dropped something into my heart. And He, he, he said this. He said, when you work well, it is an act of worship. When you work well, it is an act of worship. You worship by your work. I said, you mean, Lord, when I go into work, that actually can be worship? I can, I can worship you by my work? And he said, yes, when you work well, it is an act of worship. Now, I didn't hear an audible voice in my, in my, in, in my automobile, and I didn't have somebody bounding me on the shoulders like Pastor Derek did when he shared his story this morning. But I had this sense inside, and it opened up my heart to a realization that just in work, I can worship. And then later on, as I was growing in my faith, I read a statement by Olympia Merrick Little. And some of you say, Olympia Merrick Little, that's not somebody that I know. You have to go way back for him. But they did a movie about his life. It was called Chariots of Fire. Remember the slow motion run? Dun, 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 dun. I can't slow motion run. Um, but <laughs> This really helped me because Eric was being criticized once by his sister. Eric had a call of God on his life. Eric was going to be a missionary and was going to was going to share the gospel, but he also was very fast and he was being recruited to run on the Olympic uh, team. I believe it was the Scotland Olympic team. And this is the statement he made to his sister. And this statement really impacted me. He says, I believe that God made me for a purpose. And he was talking about being used by God to spread the gospel. But I also but he also made me fast. I believe God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. Well, he was worshiping through doing what God made him to do. God was pleased with that. Do you ever feel God's pleasure by the work that you do, how you do your work? Do you go home from work and it's almost like God says, good job. You did well. You worked hard. You represented me well. You can worship through your work. And it's an effective and very, very good way of worshiping through work. Now, I can go on and explain all the different ways that this could happen. However, somebody made a video of it. As I was preparing for this message, you know, I just typed in into my search engines with different video sources that I have, work and worship, and lo and behold, somebody did an incredible job of doing a video about this. So I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to let the video talk to you about how you can worship through work. Work. 
Most of us spend over half our lives at work. Whatever it is you fill the nine to five with, planting crops, building cars, taking care of patients, teaching students, or running a business, work is where most of life happens. For some, work is a drain. They dread Monday mornings, forcing themselves to struggle through because they need the paycheck, while many times feeling trapped and beaten down by their job. Some people love their work. They're good at what they do. It energizes them. It's a place of security, a place to chase dreams, desires, and success. At work, they find fulfillment. We often forget to connect our faith to our work. We don't consider the reasons God may have us at our job. We don't think about the purpose and meaning we could bring to our work. We simply focus on how it makes us feel. But what if we saw our work as an opportunity to worship? As Christians, we are called to serve Christ with our lives. For a few, that means working as a pastor, a youth minister, or a missionary. Others serve the church by teaching children or singing in the choir. But when Sunday is over, most of us return to our jobs outside the church. For us, our mission is in the marketplace. We may not be the kind of missionary who moves to the far regions of Africa, but around the conference table, around the water cooler, around the cubicle, we have an opportunity to worship the God who created us. He gave us skill. He gave us passion. He gave us work. When we do our jobs with excellence and integrity and diligence, it's an act of worship. We are displaying God's craftsmanship to the non-believing world around us. We are earning the right to be heard. We don't see a divide between Sunday and Monday, between the sacred and the secular. We've been invited into parts of the world that a pastor or a traditional missionary will never see. We have conversations with people who would never set foot in a church. Whether we love or dread our work, we choose to turn the focus away from ourselves and toward the mission God has for us. Church is not the only place we worship, and Sundays are not the only days in our calendars that have meaning. Every day on mission for God brings us great joy. Like the heroes before us, we can be modern day Noahs and Josephs and Peters who are called with a purpose. God has designed us. He created us to work and to worship. For us, Work is worship. That is a point that I am so glad I learned early in my Christian walk because it really helped me to not be concerned about merging my secular. See, I haven't always been in pastoral ministry. I've worked in retail. I've worked in banking. I uh, uh, found Christ uh, while I was uh, in the banking industry. I worked in the television industry, both secular and Christian. Most of my years were in the secular industry at an ABC affiliate. Work became a way for me to worship beyond Sundays and Wednesdays when I came into a church service and the music led me to his presence. I honored God through work. The second way that we express worship is through this concept called honor. In the Bible, the words worship and honor are tied closely together. We're going to look at a couple of verses from the Psalms. First of all, Psalm 22, verse 23. Listen to what the psalmist said. It's coming up on the screen. Praise the Lord, all you who fear him. Honor him, all you descendants of Jacob. Almost in you know one verse after another. Praise and honor. Show him reverence, all you descendants of Israel. Those three words close together. Then in the 29th Psalm, verses 1 and 2, it says, Honor the Lord, ye heavenly beings. Honor the Lord for the glory, for his glory and his strength. You may have an older translation that says, Ascribe these things to the Lord. That means worship, speak them out. Honor the Lord for the glory and his strength. And then it says, Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. When we give proper honor to God and the things of God, that is an act of worship. And one of the first ways that we can honor or worship through honoring is in our posture, both physical and internal. Listen to what Psalm 95 says in verses 6 and 7. Come, let us worship and bow down. Actually, um, I jumped ahead. Go back to where you were on the screen. Thank you for keeping me straight. Um, listen to what the devil told Jesus to do. It's up there on the screen. I will give all of these things to you if you will kneel down and 
worship. The devil was saying, listen, Jesus, all it's going to take from you is the bowing of your knee, kneeling down and worshiping. We can worship by the posture of our bodies, kneeling, hands uplifted. Would most of you consider this a posture of worship? Okay. Usually our physical posture reflects our inner posture. And it's not just our physical posture, it's our inner posture. There are times where I am not doing anything but standing, but inside I am bowing my heart in awe of God or in worship of God. Most of the time when I do that, I'm not bowing like this, tapping my foot. When is he going to get done? Is this thing ever going to end? I got stuff to do. You know, the Pacers are playing at 1 o'clock. And it's game 7. And I got lunch. I'm not sure that's a posture of honor. (laughs) But Jesus said... If you will kneel. And then in Psalm 95, verses 6 and 7, the psalmist said this, Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God. There is an appropriate place for the expression of worship in the actual physical posture of your body. There is an appropriate place for that. And in our evening service tonight of praise and worship, you are welcome to... To express that. You are on Sunday mornings. I think it's more um, uh, difficult for people to to come to the front and to kneel before the Lord or to kneel at their seat because people are going, what are they doing? What are they up to? But so we give you opportunities where that expression won't make you feel as uh, like you're being singled out or or something has, has stood out to you. So we honor by our physical and our inner posture. We honor, which is another way for worship, by our physical and inner posture. The next way we honor, and I've talked about this before, so I'm going to touch on it. Pastor Derek's already talked about it, is we honor through giving. We honor through giving. Honor the Lord with your wealth, Proverbs 3, verse 9 and 10 says. Honor the Lord with your wealth. And again, honor is a way of worshiping. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. Then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. When we receive the offering here at the church, we worship with our giving. It is a way of worshiping and it's a way of worshiping outside of the normal way of music and singing. So we honor by our posture. We honor by our giving And here's a third way that we worship by giving honor. And I want you to see if any of you have ever run across any of these expressions. To what do we owe the honor of your presence? Or we are honored by your presence. Or it would be a pleasure and an honor if you and your wife, etc. Think about that. Most of us realize it on Formal invitations, just like this one coming up on the screen. A formal wedding invitation oftentimes states something like this. Dr. and Mrs. Millerad Millick request the honor of your presence. They request the honor of your presence at the marriage of their daughter. The honor of your presence. See, when you then go to that wedding, you honor the bride and the groom. You honor the parents of the groom. You honor the parents of the bride when you come to the wedding. Not only do we honor by our physical and inner posture, not only do we honor by giving, we also honor by our presence. We worship by our presence. You honor the Lord when you are present during church services. Here this morning... You are worshiping by your presence. Most of you. Hopefully all of you. See, it says, Dr. and Mrs. Millerid Millick request the honor of your presence at the marriage of your daughter. Now I want to ask you a question. Would you purposely dishonor Dr. and Mrs. Millick and come 20 minutes, 
30 minutes or even 10 minutes late to their child's wedding? Would you purposely do that? Why? Because that would dishonor them. But how many people who call themselves worshipers of God dishonor him regularly by purposely coming 10, 20, or 30 minutes late to a worship service? You can just say, ouch, John. Would you purposely dishonor Dr. and Mrs. Millick and get up during the wedding of their child and go out to the lobby and spend the next 20 minutes talking to your friends about the Pacers or about your job or about remodeling your kitchen? Yet many people who call themselves worshipers of God dishonor him and do just that in the lobby of churches every single week. See, you worship by your presence, not just your physical butt in the seat. Would you purposely dishonor Dr. and Mrs. Millick and play Candy Crush or watch YouTube videos during the wedding of their child? If you were 12, you might. But if you're 52, you have dishonored that family. Yet many people who call themselves worshipers of God are engaged with a game, social media, or watching videos during church services. And if worship is expressed through honoring God, then you are not worshiping when you dishonor God by the way that you behave or treat the service of worship that you attend. And I know that I'm stomping on a few toes. But people of God, you want to receive from God. And when God is dishonored, do you think he's inclined to pour on you? About six months ago, I listened to a message that I found both humorous and convicting by a pastor by the name of John Gray. Now, Pastor John Gray is an African-American firebrand of a pastor. And in this message, he had a small portion where he talked about this thing that he calls the culture of casual. I encourage you to watch the screens and hear what he has to say. And I'm not talking natural, I'm talking spiritual, because for too long we've, we have now been infected with the spirit of casual. We have been infected with the culture of casual. Everything's real casual now. People are casual with the things of God, casual with the presence of God, casual with the worship of God. We come in when we want, we leave when we want. We check our watch in the middle of worship, we check emails in the middle of worship, and God is like, y'all see, they need a miracle, and they worrying about an email, but if they just put the phone down and lifted their hands... Because the culture of casual has infected contemporary Western Christian thought. And there's nothing wrong with being dressed casual. In fact, it probably helps you to get your worship on. You understand what I'm saying? Because you got on six girdles and four pairs of high heels. You can't really do what you want. You can't really get in there like you want. You understand? But when you come in here with your khakis on and you got your little situation and your Jordans on, you like, God, I'm coming for you. I'm coming to lift you up. I don't care what the person next to me thinks. I don't need a casual encounter. I need a miracle encounter and I need it today. That's kind of in your face. But I wonder how true it really is. We've been infected with the spirit of casual. People are casual with the things of God, casual with the presence of God, and casual with the worship of God. And you know, it's been the one statement. I was going to put it on the screen, and I thought, no, it's, he just said it. But they come to church looking for a miracle, but they're more... They're more concerned about an email. I 
I don't know where this comes down for you guys. But ask yourself, where has the spirit of casual entered into your worship? I don't know how many years ago this was. It's been quite a while. But there was a, there was a man and his family, and, and this man was on the leadership team of the church, and man, they just always ran late. And he would come, oh, you know, I'm just, I'm sorry, you know, it's so hard to get a family ready. You know, they had some children and stuff. So hard to get, get the family ready. And, you know, I thought, well, I can understand we've had kids too. You just start a little earlier. But um, one time the family came in and I saw, and the, the kids were there. The kids were old enough. I knew them and I could talk to them and I am. I, I, I said, oh, man, kind of a rough morning. You guys got up late and said, oh, no, we're ready 10 minutes early. It's dad. Dad, yeah. Oh, yeah, he's the last one who rolls out of bed, and, and, you know, we're always waiting for him. I thought, busted. <laughs> busted. It's very casual. Why don't you think about it? Again, now, you probably don't go to weddings every week, and certainly there are things that come up that get people to, late, to be late at church. But if you're consistently late to something, it means you didn't plan to be there on time. And don't give me any excuses. Now, I didn't say occasionally late. I said consistently. It means you didn't plan to be there on time. You were squeezing the last minute of sleep, the last drop of coffee, the last little bit of the, the, the ESPN news feed that morning just to find out what the predictions are so that you could get out the door and you didn't plan for the fact that the line in Starbucks was going to be longer than you planned on or uh, you didn't plan for the fact that, oh my goodness, there was a bit of road construction or whatever it is. If you are consistently late to anything, if you are consistently late to work and you have a certain time that you need to punch in, you change what you do. If you're consistently late to the worship of God, you haven't planned on being here on time. You say, yeah, but by the time I get here and then I get my kids checked into the nursery, you didn't plan on being here on time. Now, if you say, well, I'd love to have got my kids checked into the nursery, but the nursery workers weren't there, then that becomes our problem. And we need to know about it. And no, I'm stepping on some toes, but Why? Because one of the things that Nathaniel brought out and one of the things that Pastor Matt brought out is that worship has an impact on us. Honoring God has an impact on us. And as we worship properly, it makes a difference in us. It prepares us to go out and do what God wants us to do. And isn't he worthy of honor? Worship is expressed through work. Worship is expressed through honor. Lastly, worship is expressed through obedience. Now, there's four lines on it. I don't know what my fourth point was. I prepared this, gave it to Christy. She printed it up really nice. And um, I looked at it today, and it's like, I wonder what my fourth point was. So I went to my notes. I said, I don't have a fourth point. So you can leave that one blank. Going back to what uh, happened when Jesus was tempted by the devil. The devil said, I will give it all to you if you will kneel down and worship me. Look what Jesus said. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him, for the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Worship and service, worship and obedience tied very closely together. Pastor Matt Eckert, again, said this two weeks ago. Worship is love responding to love. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes on him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's God's love for us. So, how do we respond backwards to God with love? There it is, John 14.15. Jesus said this, If you love me, obey my commandments. Your love expressed back to God is expressed in obedience. You express worship when you obey. You express worship when you obey. If you love me, obey my commandments. Well, what are we supposed to obey then? What are Jesus' commandments? Mark chapter 12, verses 30 through 32. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, 
all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The secondly is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. Serving and obeying the Lord is another way that you and I worship outside of music. When you obey when it's hard, when you do what the Word of God says, although it's not convenient, when you do what the Word of God says, and it may mean a loss of a promotion or a loss of a bonus because you're not going to sell that product by cheating someone, when you do that, that is an act of worship. We can worship through our work and how we work and honor.